Okay, so um, thank you very much for the nice invitation. It's a fantastic workshop. Uh, so Sally already motivates that uh, the power network is going to change in the coming decades into a very different system, and the way we operate them also needs to change, and it, it will become distributed energy resources, and we'll see more of that. Um, so really, we're at a watershed moment, and I think the most important thing uh, in, for, in this context is for the students, that uh, I'd like to motivate many of you to look at energy. So clearly, energy and environments are the most critical, massive problems of your time. And we need to solve this problem, and there's a deadline. We don't know whether it's 50 years or 500 years, but we need to solve this problem. So if we look at the two largest networks that human built, the telephone network and the power network, both actually started around the same time, about 130 years ago, in a very similar regulatory engineering and economic market structure. And both provide a single commodity extremely reliably both grew extremely fast through the two wars, post-war, and both even started to deregulate around the same time. So the parallel development between the two really start, uh, stopped uh, about 20 years ago when the telephone network made an architectural transformation into the internet today. And that changes everything. It changes with impact way beyond communication, beyond networking. It changes multiple industries and so on. So the question is, perhaps the power network in the coming decades would also undergo a architectural transformation with equally large impact. It might become the largest and most complex internet of things. What will drive, and in that process, is, is huge transformation that the, the industry landscape has to change dramatically. The infrastructure has to change dramatically from a vertically integrated, centrally controlled architecture to a layer architecture, again, with impacts way beyond just the engineering. So what will drive the power network? And there are many drivers, and here are two of them. If you look at the two economic sectors that consumes the most energy, so any form of energy, is the electricity generation and transportation. So they consume more than two-thirds of energy in the US in 2014. The biggest greenhouse gas emitters, again, the same two sectors, electricity generation and transportation. They generate more than half of greenhouse gases in the US. And therefore, if we are really want to drastically reduce greenhouse gases, then we don't have any choice except to increase renewable generations in our electricity portfolio and also electrify the, the transportation. So let's just look at the first thing, the renewable generations, right? So that's the, the motivation we've seen in, in Michael's talk in, in, in Sally's talk as well. How we are doing, and we're not doing very well, at least at this point. So right now, if we look at, we just zoom in, all fossils still generate about 68% of all electricity in the US. Nuclear is about 20%, pretty steady. Hydro is about 8 to 10%, pretty steady. So the renewables, mainly wind and solar, is hard to even register at that, at that scale, at that time scale. So if we blow that up, then we'll see that indeed wind has been increasing quite rapidly. Solar is still small. So the two combines about 5% uh, nationwide. But the solar, even though it's still very small, the, the slope is huge. So someone did a calculation, forecast all the energy demands uh, in 2030 and, see, and say, if we want to provide all the energy demand just from solar, how much area do we need? So the point is that it doesn't need a lot. So nature has more, than, more energy than we ever need. It's up to scientists and engineers and economists and, and social policy makers and so on to really capture the energy, transmit it, and manage it, which is difficult. But that's exactly the kind of work that the, the barrier is high, the reward is high. They're exactly the kind of work that MIT is known for and ideas that can make a huge con uh, tr contribution. In. So, What's, what would be the huge challenge? If we think about that the demand will continue to grow, there's still, as Bob said, 1.2 billion people who don't have reliable energy, electricity. So the demand will continue to grow. There's enough energy in nature that we ever need, clean energy. The manufacturing will continue, the cost of manufacturing, of communications, and 
IT technologies and so on will continue to drop. And there was someone is going to figure out how to capture this energy. Someone is going to figure out how to store them, perhaps. Someone is going to figure out how to deploy the different devices and, and so on. So we will have a probably most complex and largest Internet of Things, which will become our energy power system. So what will be the bottleneck? I think one of the bottlenecks that IDSS uh, in particular can make a huge contribution is really develop the technology, the theories and the algorithms, the systems that will really help understand and guide the transformation of our power system. So if you look at today's system, and Sally already uh, looked at this a little bit. So right now in the US, the, uh, as Bob mentioned earlier, the challenge in power system is really there's no inventory, essentially. So supply needs to be balanced with demand at all times, at all points of the network, which is extremely difficult. And that's also one of the reasons we have, we have such a complex electricity markets that, that Bill will talk about. And how is this supply-demand balance uh, controlled currently? It's controlled at a few large control points. So these are the centralized generators, about 10,000 of them in, in the US. So these are where the active control, con active uh, uh, monitoring and control takes place. There are many, many dumb loads, 131 customers, and billions of passive loads. All they do is consume. So if you have a network of large network passive loads, it's relatively stable, relatively easy to control. So I need to speed up. And therefore, the, 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 in the last 100 years, the pipeline has been scheduled supply to meet the demand. So we can forecast aggregate demand. We can schedule supply, which is complete, completely controllable. So it's centralized, human in the loop, worst case, and all that. In the future, it probably needs to be opposite. So we will have more and more, hopefully, supplies that are not dispatchable, more and more uh, intelligent loads. So these are distributed energy resources, like the home-based um, system that Sally talked about. It can be electric vehicles, smart buildings, smart appliances, wind turbines, and so on and so forth. So these are active endpoints, unlike today's endpoints, most of today's endpoints. They, some of them can generate. Some of them can measure, communicate, compute, and actuate. So now we have a huge network of active endpoints, which is both a risk and opportunity. And the challenge is, how do we build such a system and control and optimize and so on to match demand to varying supplies? So some of the technical challenges, given the time, I will, I will skip that. Uh, but tons of interesting problems uh, that, that hopefully some, some of the students here will be uh, interested in working on. So let me just uh, give one example. Optimal power flow is one of the fundamental problems in the power system. And the reason it's important is because many power system operations and planning applications can be formulated abstractly as an optimization problem called optimal power flow. It's simply a constraint optimization where you want to minimize certain costs subject to a bunch of constraints. And one of the key constraints is Kirchhoff laws, so laws of physics that determines how power flows would distribute over the network. And that is, turns out to be the one, of the most, one of the most important computational challenge to this set of optimal power flow problems. And therefore, for many applications, power system applications, we have to somehow implicitly or explicitly solve this set of power flow equations. And that's the computational challenge. Now, um, and therefore, in, in, the way we do it now for the applications today so far is that we formulate the problem, we solve it iteratively until it converges, and then we apply the solution. That's not very suitable for the real-time optimization at scale of distributed energy resources in the future. But if we think about the network is actually solving these powerful equations for us at scale in real time for free. And therefore, for many applications, perhaps, we can explicitly exploit the network as powerful, powerful equation solvers. And if we do that, then we will also get algorithms that naturally adapt to evolving network conditions. So this is sort of a uh, high level thinking, but you can look at say the power flow, optimal power flow problems, you can apply this, uh, this, this uh, thinking. And then let me just close with a simple example where, which is the frequency control at the fast time scale, which also is, uh, has a connection to, to MIT. Uh, so uh, frequency control. So the frequency control currently again is the frequency at every point in the network needs to lie within a very narrow band of a nominal frequency. 
when it deviates, it means supply is uh, there's a supply imbalance in supply and demand, and therefore that needs to uh, the control mechanism, a whole set of control mechanisms kicks in on the generator side to change the supply to manage the demand. An interesting idea, which originally here at MIT 35 years ago, uh, suggests that perhaps we can use intelligent loads. So in that changes, or in addition to changing supply, we can also change the demand. And if we do this low side frequency control, it has many interesting applications. So in this uh, paper by Threpi uh, 35 years ago, there are three interesting ideas. One is the low side frequency control. Secondly is the spot price, spot market to incentivize that. And then the third is that we need an IT infrastructure in order to implement. So the idea was ignored for three decades. Uh, there wasn't a huge need, nor the technologies. Both have changed today. Now, if we do continuous ubiquitous low side control, then we can help renewable integration because as we have more and more renewable generation, the capacity for the control on the generator side as it decreases. It become, it's also arguably faster because lows have low or uh, no inertia. Uh, it's arguably more reliable if you have a large number ubiquitous control everywhere and you can perhaps localize disturbance much faster than having the disturbance propagate all the way to generators and then you do the control and propagate that. Is there sufficient capacity in the load to provide that? Well, there's a study uh, that suggests the answer is yes. The grid-friendly appliances only on the, just on the residential side is about the same order as the current operating research. And therefore, how do we, the question is how do we design such a system, which is very different from, from before. So uh, I'll, I'll skip the detail, but the idea of high-level idea is that we have a system which is given by, let's say, some differential equations, which is the system we are given. And what we would like is to design controllers for this PI, which can be the load. Right? So how do we do that? There are many ways to do it. The first thing we do is to say, what do we want to achieve in steady state? So the, the frequency control is a very fast time scale. It needs to get to the steady state quickly. What do we want the steady state to, to look like? And there's a bunch of objectives that power system need to achieve. You can formal, formalize that as an optimization problem. And therefore, the problem becomes that given a network, which is the upper boss on the, on the left, uh, there's a given dynamic we don't have control. We want to design the feedback system the boss at the bottom so that two things. Number one is asymptotic is stable. And number two, the equilibrium solves the optimization problem that, that formalizes the, the objectives of what we want to achieve. And if you do that, again, the, uh, the way, one way to think about designing this box is to think about the optimization problem, and you have to modify this in, in some, uh, in, in some uh, careful way. Then, suppose you just do first order, the simplest first order primal dual algorithm. Then you want to design it so that the closed loop system, that is the given network dynamics, plus the active control that you actually apply, the closed loop system implements the primal dual algorithm for the modified optimization problem that you, st that you start out with. If you do that, then indeed you will, get, you will achieve your control goals in equilibrium. It also helps the stability analysis. You can show that despite the, the um, uh, non-linearities and so on, it, it, can, it can be stable and optimal in equilibrium. So if you do that, then you get a, a nice distributed architecture. And depending on the goal you want, you may need to have a cyber network that works with the, um, uh, the power network that is given. So I'll close with that. Thank you very much. So Stephen, that's a nice example at the end of, of uh, load side or demand side management. Uh, nice analysis of the, the control system and, and, the, and the dynamics. What about the consumer and the behavior of consumers? Will they, will they do this or, or right. adopt these technologies? Uh, right. So in my talk, I focus on the simpler thing, which is how do we design, so as a social planner, what is the optimal thing to do? Yeah. Right? And then what will be the control algorithms and optimizations and so on? Then the harder question, I leave it with Bill. That is, how do we design market mechanisms yeah. to incentivize so that people do the right thing? And, and Bill will tell us if, if markets, if consumers will be rational with the markets too, right? So. And, 